it, you can't create a piece of paper that says, mm -hmm. okay, you promised to kill me. It doesn't work that way in this country. If it still comes with this drama, then I am talking to you. Then okay. if, the, if the drama cannot be avoided, then I must go fighting. I said that last time. Okay. I don't think I've checked you guys about. You have jerked us friend. No, I told you that last time. Man, I have never seen a detective get as pissed as this in an interrogation. This other detective seems to agree that this guy is a, he's a troublemaker. I've done this job for 31 years, and I will tell you, the homicides that I've investigated, you have made me work the hardest in my 31 years. Yeah, this guy is a troublemaker for sure. Well, of course he is. He made his way down to Texas from Ohio, killing four people along the way. And one of his victims was a guy who looked like him. He killed the guy and attempted to take on his identity. The whole story is crazy, but maybe the news can explain it better than I can. In the past hour, we confirmed the prime suspect in a double murder in Tucumcari has now been tied to some killings in Ohio. Two weeks ago, Muzi Wakathula Madonda was arrested in Texas after he allegedly killed a man and his stepson in a Tucumcari motel. Wow. Wow. Did you just hear what I heard? Give that newscaster an Emmy. There was zero space behind what that male newscaster said. She was locked and loaded. She spit that sentence out better than any rapper north of Young Jeezy. I can't even type that sentence without performing at least three Google searches. Scotty Schwartz has the new developments from the newsroom. Scotty. Tom Amusi Wakathula Madonda. Okay, he got the name right, but not without looking down at his notes. Two weeks ago, Muzi Wakathula Madonda was arrested in Texas after he allegedly killed a man and his stepson in a Tucumcari motel. Eye contact straight at the camera, doesn't miss a single beat. Man, what a professional. Scotty Schwartz has the new developments from the newsroom. Scotty. Tom, Musi Wakathula Madonda has now been linked to four different murders. Authorities say before he was in New Mexico, he may have killed a bank executive in Akron, Ohio, and a fellow South African immigrant near Dayton, Ohio, over the winter. Two weeks ago, state police say Madonda killed 37-year-old Gabriel Baca and 57-year-old Bobby Gonzalez. Gonzalez and Baca were found dead inside of a Tucumcari motel. Madonda then fled to Conroe, Texas, where U.S. Marshals in the Texas Rangers caught him. According to an Ohio newspaper, while being held in Houston, Madonda confessed to the murder of a bank vice president because he wanted to clear his conscience. We are going to watch that interrogation. But first, let's cover the backstory. Muzi Wakathula Madonda, a citizen of South Africa, came to the U.S. to work for Six Flags on a special international workers program. While working, he met another South African, one who shared a resemblance to him. For reasons, Muzi Wakathula decided to kill this man and steal his identity. But before doing so, he broke into the house of the vice president of a bank in Akron, Ohio, killing her. He then laid his trap for the other South African native, luring him into the woods, killing him, taking his documents, and then fleeing to New Mexico. There, he would commit two more murders before fleeing again, this time to Texas, where the Texas Rangers would eventually capture him. Man, where to even start with this case? On my small YouTube channel here, this is by far the biggest case I've worked on. I have several hours of interrogation footage from multiple detectives and multiple police departments. I have over 800 pages of documents and evidence, including Facebook and Google subpoenas. I even have these polygraph results that are meaningless to me. And while I can certainly make a documentary on this guy, after dozens of hours of research, I have decided that the best video I can make is the one that focuses on the most interesting points. Thus, I have narrowed down the scope of this video to two aspects of this case. First is the murder of Zenzele Madane. I'm sorry, I don't have a newscaster to give me the correct pronunciation there. He is the South African whom Muzi Wakathula targeted due to looking similar to him. Zenzele was lured into a trap by Muzi Wakathula, killed and robbed of his identifying documents. And second is the multiple attempts, possibly insincere attempts, to expedite his trial by insisting on the death penalty. 
Muziwa Cthulhu claims to be doing so as a way to alleviate the grieving family members of his victims, but the detectives dealing with him seem to think he's just jerking them around. We are going to watch both of these interrogations. Let's dive right in. My name's Carl Bush, and you can call me Carl, you're more than welcome to. I feel so comfortable. So who's Rich Bush? Pardon me? Who is Rich Bush? Rich Bush? I think they made a mis- Did you read that somewhere? Perhaps. Yeah, well, uh, they've called me detective, and they've misplaced my name. Uh, I'm a captain. Uh, but um, it's good to meet you finally. And uh, I hear that you're wanting to tell, tell us and let us know what happened. And I really, uh, I really do appreciate that. I really do. Okay. And uh, if you have any questions as we go through, take your time. Uh, ask. Uh, if you've got something on your mind, feel free to ask. Uh, if you need a break, holler and ask. Um, I have a form here uh, that... I usually fill out, but uh, I understand that you don't like signing forms and doing that. Uh, yeah, I just talk. And just talk? Okay. Well, since that's uh, that's the case, then I'll just read this to you, and we'll do it that way. Uh, I'm pretty pretty good at adapting when I have to, and uh, yeah, you're being good to us, and I appreciate that, and I'll show you that. Lord, it's it. Back. Okay. I'm going to read you um, your Miranda warning. You understand what your Miranda warning is? Okay. And uh, Texas and Ohio is a little different on some of these things, so bear with us. <laughs> yeah. So bear with us. Um, uh, first of all, uh, how many years of school have you completed? Total. So I've got two degrees. You've got two degrees? Uh, did you finish those at the same time? Or? No, no. So school... I'll say uh, 12 first, and then five, five, 22 years of school. 22 years of schooling. <clears throat> okay. And um, I'm still working on a couple of mine. I have class in the morning. I have class about it. It's very fun. Um, uh, my uh, finishing a second bachelor's in criminal justice. Why don't you want to prosecute it? Oh, no. No, 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 I couldn't. I don't know that I could do that, or I really want to, but uh, I'm working on my second degree, and um, I have class at 8.30 tomorrow morning, so. So I fly back today? How, how long is the flight? Uh, it, uh, I think it was two hours and like 15 minutes here, so flew in this morning, and uh, fly back later tonight, and get a little bit of sleep and for class in the morning. Tough it out. Uh, you read and write English? Yeah, self-taught for some Zoom, but yeah, I, I, okay. I okay. learned English and I speak it and I write it, yeah, I read it. Okay, very well. Um, but since you're not going to want, you don't want to um, sign this form and go through it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it to you and then I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. I'm sure that you've done this before already. Uh, and even in the state of Ohio, Every county is almost different with some of the things that we do. So, if this is repetitive, can I see that? Maybe I'll fit it. Maybe. But it might be easier for you if I fit it myself. And if you would like to, that would be great. Yeah, I appreciate that. What's in front of Mine? Uh, that's yours. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, you're being interviewed in regards to the crime of murder. Before we ask you any questions, you must understand your rights. Number one, you have the right to remain silent. You do not have to make any statements or answer any questions. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Number two, anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. Do you understand that? Number three, you have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice before we ask you any questions and to have a lawyer with you during any questioning. Do you understand that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, when I ask you that, could you just say yes for me? So I don't have to, it's a, it's a thing with our, my boss. Number three, uh, let's see, we're on number three, we're on number four. Four, if you do not have the money to hire a lawyer, 
A lawyer appointed by the court or a lawyer from the public defender's office will be provided to you before and during any questioning without any cost to you. Do you understand that? Yes. Thank you. Number five, if you decide to answer questions now without a lawyer present, you will still have the right to stop answering at any time. You also have the right to stop answering at any time until you talk to a lawyer. Do you understand that? Okay. Next section is the waiver of rights. And I just, uh, the first one is, the above statement of rights has been read to me. Yes. I understand what my rights are. Next is, I'm willing to make a statement and answer questions. I do not want a lawyer at this time. I understand and know what I am doing. No promises or threats have been made to me, and no pressure or coercion of any kind has been used against me. And then I filled in that you've completed 22 years of school. And, Musi, I appreciate that very much. I have a pad with me. I'm not going to take notes. It's just to remind me of, I have uh, some questions that I'm sure that we will answer throughout my interview with you, but uh, so that I don't forget, because I'm getting a little bit older and I have a tendency at times to get off track and free it so that I just don't free it some things. So you understand your rights, you read your form, and you're willing to talk to me about what happened with Zinzel uh, in Dayton, Ohio. My practice was. Okay. Why don't you tell me the story, if, if you don't mind, and what, and if this is okay with you, uh, what I normally do with people is I say, tell me the story and tell me how you want to proceed with it. And then as we go through it, or as we get done, or as we go through it, if I have a question, I may pop in with a question and ask you a question just so that I clarify it in my mind. And uh, we'll go through it that way. And then I have a couple of things at the end that that you may not get to if you do that's great if not that's why i have my notes so i don't forget does that sound reasonable yeah it's okay with you okay all right so uh less than 2008 in new jersey six flags i had come from south africa he had also come from south africa i was in row Apartment 32A, he was in apartment 34B. And we came close with him because we we're from the same state or province, spoke the same language. At that time, I actually had to make my young brother really. I really liked him a lot. And we were working there, he was working at, uh, I was working at Foods, he was working at, I believe, Games. Yeah, games. Uh, we worked there. I even got there 31st of March, I believe. He got there about a month later, end of April. Um, we worked there for a couple of months. Then <clears throat> had been to his parents and rich. Come back to my mind, I'm from Philly, the village. So all my schooling was the public system. So I had been in private schools, played white, what we call white sports like rugby, cricket, and golf, and what you rich guys do. And I had not been exposed to that. So he, he had a lot of white friends and colored friends, what we call colored. You guys call everybody black here. We have blacks and colored, so they're not from mixed race people. They have their own race. So he had a lot of those friends because he had grown up with such people. And he, he used to do a lot of stuff, train, which I don't do, smoke, which I don't do, and other things, which I don't do. And uh, it so happened that towards the end of the, of the season, because Six Flags closed down every November, first weekend of November, or last weekend of, of, of October, uh, I wanted to go back to London because I had been to London, but 
the British consulate had made a ruling that if you had been to London, I mean, if you were over the age of 30, you could not come back to London unless you had special skills or you had a company that was a fine give you a job. Okay. So he was 22 and he, he had no plans to go to London. So when I would discuss this with him, um, he ended up agreeing that I would buy his ID, buy his identity. Okay. And it was on the picture, on the photos, we didn't look that much different. I mean, the person who mistaken me for him on the pictures. So, started putting a process of, I mean, a facilitation process of getting his visa from the British consulate so that they could give him a visa and I would go on his passport and he was either going to report it stolen or lost or whatever. He was going to come up with a plan because his plan was to stay in the US and study. So I paid some money towards that. At first I paid $422 towards that. And then while we were waiting for the British consulate to either say yes or no, we were confident they were going to say yes because it was only 22 at that time. And um, we had some motivation, I mean, motivating letters from Six Flags and stuff supporting his documentation. So we were confident they would get it. And, while we were waiting for that, it happened that Six Flags was closing down and on the final weekend of Six Flags closing down around the 30, 31st of October, they were drinking, oh. uh, I'm not a, a party person, I just stay in my room. So they were drinking a lot, you know, farewell, everybody's going home. And there were these guys that I, I didn't like their company because of the things they would do when they were together, like weed and coke and stuff. And I despised them. Uh, he would keep that company. He, he was not his dad, so I could not tell him what to do, but that's the company he kept. And one day he came knocking at my door. Uh, I remember because it was election weekend, uh, Obama and McCain weekend. Mm -hmm. So I was very deep into that stuff. And I used to watch Fox News every day, see how the projections and the election are going and all that. So I'm sitting there watching and then knocks at the door. Our Six Flags doors are almost like these prison cell doors. There was a glass where you could see the face of the person before you opened the door. And I saw it was Zen, so I opened the door. But Zen didn't come in. Other seven guys, seven to nine guys came in. Mostly these white, colored, and Indian boys from South Africa, mostly. Came in and ambushed me. Uh, because I thought I was better. Why I don't go out with them? Why I'm always by myself and all that? So they dragged me to my bed and started, okay, when I was a child, before I got that, I had been abused from the age of seven to the age of 15 by my uncle, sexually. And growing up since then, I've had a sexual orientation of confusion. Not confusion, I mean, I'm not bisexual. I don't even feel anything for girls at all. So I wouldn't say confusion, but it's confusion because I'm African and I'm Zulu. We, our culture, in our nature of things, men don't do those things to other men. So that's confusion because I, I know in my mind it's wrong, but that's what I feel. That's what I'm attracted to one. Okay. Uh, but I've been very disciplined in that. I've not engaged in anything physically, but when I'm behind a laptop and, you know, chat lines and uh, talking to people behind the laptop, you make yourself sound like this sex guru. No, you're not. But when a chance presents itself to do what you've been posting about behind the laptop, I never do it. I, I don't have the conviction. I don't have the, I don't have whatever it takes to do it. Yeah. So when these guys were dragging me, all those flashes of me being abused as a child came back and these guys were drunk. Uh, they were teaching me a lesson, brought down my pants and my underwear and they had, uh, I didn't see it because I was facing down someone was sitting here. I had a vibrator or a dildo, but I know it was one of those two things and they were inserting it on my arm. You know, my honest, I mean, and that was very so. Okay, even my uncle who used to abuse me had never penetrated me. Okay, he used to just stimulate me and put his dick between my, my thighs and stuff, which was confusing because I knew it was wrong, but at the same time, as a child, you enjoy whatever he was doing, though you didn't know what it was. But these guys went an extra step of actually penetrating me with whatever they had, and that hurt. Okay, and they left and I held it against him because he knew I would not have let them in had they not used him as a front. I would not have just let them in in my room. But they had used him 
And I had the chance and I didn't even wait for the consulate to answer to say either he's granted the visa to go to Britain or not. I, did, I just didn't want anything to do with him from then onwards. Because he had been used like that. And yeah. I had, had hated what had happened. So I decided to put a stop on the application that we had made. I wrote to the consulate or emailed the consulate to say we cancel the application. I wrote as him as if I was him. So the consulate stopped considering whatever we had asked them to consider. And refunded me the $422 into his account because we had used his account because it had to look like he is the one applying. So when that money came, he never emailed me, never said anything, never wrote me, never texted me, never called me. He just used my money. So I went to Ohio to work at Kalahari Water Resort. In which resort? Water, uh, Kalahari Water Resort in Sandusky. Okay. So I stayed there for a while. That's when I started. I bought a laptop. That's when I got deep into this whole set something. So I said, not doing anything, but deep into the cyber, internet stuff, um, gay porn and stuff like that, which I'm ashamed of, really. Which you won't understand until you strike with what I'm striking with. Uh, so as time went on, I traced him through Facebook. And I, you know, then I was struggling with a lot of things. So he will, when, I used to be a nice guy, I'm a Christian. I used to be a Christian, I don't know if I'm still there. I used to be a Christian, forgiving, no confused sexually, but still love God. And I was staying with a the pastor then, trying to get my life together again, trying to be serious with God. So I'll forgive him and he would borrow money and I would send him money through money cream. Maybe money cream at all much. Sometimes after I would give him money, he would disappear. He's no longer on Facebook, he's, no longer, he's ignoring me. And I would feel used, like, you, and I would tell him, you're using me. Whenever you need help, I'm your friend. Whenever, after I help you, you disappear for three, four months, you don't know me. And then I'll see you again when you need help. So, and I, I didn't appreciate that. And I made it clear to him, yeah, I don't like being used like that. I, I treat you like my brother. When you need help, I help you. I've never needed anything from you, but I'm not there for companionship when I just need us to have small talk, I whether about sports or politics back home, whatever. And I hate being used like that, you know? So as time went on, um, I, I joined DirecTV last, no, last uh, July. I was employed by DirecTV. I left, I left Ohio because the family that I lived with left and went back to Zambia in Africa on the 17th of June last year. It was a Thursday. We took them to the airport. They left. So I moved from Sandusky. I went to Cincinnati and I worked at a hotel, Comfort Inn Hotel in Eastgate, Cincinnati. Okay. So I worked there for a while. While I was working there, I was looking for other jobs. Was the family that had gone to Zambia had left me with a car. So I thought if I can get a job, we should use a van and make more money than I was making. I was making $500 a week and I was looking for a job that could pay me more. So I got a job in Chicago with DirecTV, a subcontractor of DirecTV. So I went over to Chicago, started training. They took me to Pennsylvania where I was being trained, state college, next to Penn State. I was there training. Now, with DirecTV, you're given, on average, four jobs a day. You have to be at your first job at eight, second job 11, third job at two, last job at five. This was in Saddle. And sometimes you get held up in traffic, sometimes your job is more complicated than you thought. It takes longer. You have to beat traffic. You have to speed. I had loads of speeding tickets in, in Pennsylvania. My, when I say load, about four. It's not like 12. I think I had four outstanding ones. I paid one and I didn't pay the other three. Man, I was like, oh my God. So I had about three or four outstanding tickets for Pennsylvania. I had one from New York because I had gone to Boston. It's the first time I'm saying that. So the last member of Boston now. I had gone to Boston to do something, and I had a ticket in New York, and I had a ticket in Chicago. My lawyer fought for that one. Okay, I had one in Ohio, because I had been involved in a car accident, so they sent them at points to my license. I had many warrants and things that affected my driving license. And my driving license was my daily bread, so I didn't want my driver's license suspended. Because if they suspend my driver's license, and I'm illegal in this country, I'm illegal now. Okay, I had overstayed my welcome, but I had found a loophole that I could work and earn a lot of money. Now I'm legal if I'm staying, you know, if I stay with this company that I was working for. So if my license was to be taken away from me, there's no way I would be able to make, you know, 
ends meet because this is the only job that I could get, this is the only loophole that I could exploit to continue working while I'm illegal in the country. So it happens that I'm driving from Chicago to Missouri. So I was offered there by a company from Houston, Texas, a better package. You know, they never kept their word, they were liars. But they promised me more money, more this, more this. Because I was a good worker in, you know, all over Pennsylvania, Ohio, Chicago. And when I left Chicago, uh, Pennsylvania, my boss was not happy because he had invested time in training me. Now I was a good technician, now I'm leaving him for a better company. So he held on to my salary, a two-week salary or something. And my supervisor was from Chicago. He came up with a plan. Since your boss is only wanting your money, steal the equipment. Then we can sell the equipment, then you recover the salary that you've lost. So that's what we did. We stole the equipment in Pennsylvania. My boss from Chicago. He was going to sell it in Chicago because he knew some people would buy it and then we'll cut it in half and I'll recover my almost thirty three hundred dollars that I had lost in income over those two weeks. Which never happened. He never till today he never gave me that money, by the way. So I'm, I'm driving from Pennsylvania to Chicago, from Chicago to Missouri to start my new job in Independence, where I'm stopped by a traffic call because I was driving at 69 miles an hour in a 45 mile construction site. I had never seen it's a construction site. And I think when you start speeding, even when there's no need to speed, you end up speeding. That's my, I, I, I used to say, say to people, I have one addiction, speeding. I, uh, there was no need to speed. But I was speeding. I didn't even see it's a construction site 45 miles long. I didn't see anything. Um, uh, this guy wrote me a ticket and called me. He said I need to go to court because I was in the issuing state, the state that had issued the license. So I had to go to court on the 18th of November to tell the judge why I was speeding. I mean, why are you speeding? What was I going to say? And I, had all, I knew that in court on the 18th of November, all these other outstanding warrants will be there on fire. My license will be suspended and I will lose my job and that will be the end for me. So I decided not to go to court and I realized that the next stop, whatever, whatever that would be, the next stop, it will be the end of the road because the license will be suspended even if I'm not in court and the next police, uh, traffic cop who runs my license will say you're traffic on a suspended license. I don't know what happened on that. I know, I, but I knew it would be the end of the road for me. That's when the Zen hatred came back, like, not hatred, but that's when I, I hatched this evil plan of, man, you remember 08, you wanted to buy Zen's ID, what if you buy his, you get his ID now, and you get a new ID under his name, a new driver's license, and then, now with the new license, you start from scratch, no, no, no speeding, nothing, nothing. Okay, and I motivated that with, this fake hatred was he had opened the door for those guys, he deserves to die anyway, and he owes me money, which he will never pay. Uh, yet, let me hunt him down and kill him and get his ID. I know where I can go to a DMV, they'll never tell the difference. That's what I thought. Of which they would, yeah, they would, they would not tell it anyway. So, started hunting the guy, you know, I will find him, he will disappear, ended up hiring services of detectives online, some not net detectives. I tried net detective too. I tried everything then, trying to track this guy. I could not get the guy. But he was in Alabama. I knew he was in Alabama somewhere in Huntsville, but I could not locate him specifically that he is here. After hunting him down for a while, I thought I had found him in Alabama. I had found an address because I had called his parents pretending to be some lawyer in America who needed his address because I was helping him with schooling and stuff and his parents had given me his address. And when I went to that address, I drove all the way from Missouri, 10 hours or whatever, however long it took me to go to Alabama. Uh, okay, I had spoken to my boss, direct TV boss, and he had gotten me a gun. And I was going to kill him in Alabama last year. Um, I went down to Alabama to that address. I came with his pictures. They said, oh, this guy has just moved. He's just, he's no longer here. He moved about a month ago. So I was late, so I went back to Missouri. That's when I, I, I got the services of those online detectives. I don't know their name. Detective something, but not net detectives. And they hunted him down and locate, they located him in East Brunswick, New Jersey. Okay. And I was ready to go to East Brunswick, which is a 17 hour trip. Yeah. You know, when you are evil, the things, I mean, you drive 17 hours to kill a person who's done nothing, really. Because you need his ID, because 
I was ready to go drive and go there. Then I decided to call the hotel to confirm he was still there. He had checked out that day, early in the morning. There, this guy. So then I come up with another strategy of being friends again. Forget the past, uh, man. Let's move forward, you know. Let's be friends again. And I go to North Dakota while I was there. He buys this being friends again thing. He needs money again. Just the internet? Yeah, or well, everything was like. Uh, either through Facebook or emails, mostly emails. So he needs money. He says he needs uh, $378. So I sent him from why not North Dakota to New York. He was in New York this time. So I sent him the money. And um, I, the reason I'm sending him the money, I'm trying to bring him closer so that he can trust me enough to meet me. I think, he, I don't know, for some reason, he, he didn't trust me for some reason. Uh, I don't know why, but he knew he had wronged me. So yeah, he, I think he knew, he thought I was a bad person. He, he thought I could retaliate or something. Because he could tell when we talked that he didn't trust me. Uh, but I tried. I deceived him and I trapped him. I set a trap for him. And we were friends now, forget the past and all that. And I sent him money in New York and he was struggling in New York. So I said to him, because when I was in Six Flags, New Jersey, I had met a Jewish family and I had met a Greek family while I was in Six Flags. We became friends with those families. The Greek family were McCain fans and Jewish family were Obama fans, so we used to discuss a lot of politics. So they would invite me over to their houses. One is in Upper East Side, Manhattan, the Jewish family, and the other one, the Greek family, is in Long Island. So I would go visit there. So I, I used the Jewish family lying to him. I said, you know, the Jewish family can take you in. I want you to meet them. Since you're in New York, they can help you with a place to stay and with money. You know, of course, I was going to Berkeley College now. We needed money a lot. So, but you have to come to Dayton, Ohio, because they have a farmhouse there, which they don't have, so that you can meet them in Dayton, Ohio. But the guy was smart. Zed was smarter than me. I thought he would see through it, but he fell for it. And he guess the guy was desperate. Because in the past, he would not have fallen for it. But this time, he just, oh, that sounds like a good idea. OK, I'll come. And he kept the day, too. Uh, was the plan was to kill him, take his ID, go to, go to New Mexico. Because New Mexico, Washington, and Utah were the three states where you could still get a license, even if you were an alien. So I was going to go to New Mexico because Utah, you could not use their license as an ID. I could not go to Washington because they wanted you to have been there for 30 days minimum. I didn't have 30 days to sit around. New Mexico, you could open a bank account today, get a license tomorrow. So I had done my research. So I thought I'm going to New Mexico. But I needed money to go to New Mexico to survive six weeks because in New Mexico, they give you uh, a temporary license today and then they send you the permanent or the V driver's license six weeks later to your mailing address. So I needed money to pay for the hotel for six weeks and to survive in New Mexico for six weeks. That's when I hatched the plan to go, I'm sure you know now about Akron. Yeah, so that's when I hatched the plan to go to Akron and steal the money because I thought that lady had a safe because she was the, uh, the vice president of a bank. Some of your vice presidents are very rich. They have safes everywhere. I assume she had a safe. She said she didn't have it. So but the plan was to not to kill her. I never planned to kill her. I thought that she would see the gun, she would be subdued, she would give me what I want, I leave, kill her. It was always a plan of mine to kill him, unfortunately. Um, showing you how bad I am, you know, really. Because I had that one taste, there's no one state that covered my brother. Like, you know, to guess what I'm desperate to do some nonsense, really. Desperate times, but desperate measures, so. Um, so he came to Dayton, to have killed Jackie on Thursday, didn't get any money. I could have taken some money, but I decided not to, because I knew I could, it could be trash back to me somehow, it was very big chance. That day, that Saturday was terrible. Because I had to drive around in the morning, look for the sport where I'm going to kill him, where he, you know, nobody will see it. I'm driving around and no, I'm contrasted within me. Should I continue? Why did it stop? Don't do it. But I need the license. You know, oh God. Until uh -huh. I found that place in the Butler Township in the woods there. Man, I went to pick him up. Even when I went to pick him up, I'm still, I still had an option not to do it. And I'm, I'm still thinking, you know, 
closing. But now, I'll be honest with you, there was a time when I, I decided when we were there, like, I'm not going to do this. But now, this guy, I've lied to him and said, he's going to meet this Jewish family. What am I going to say to him now? That was my, now my biggest problem now. If I mean, see the guy, and I let him go, the Jewish family, he's come all the way from New York. Yes, I am. I'm the one who had bought him the ticket in the bus, but, you know, so he went there. The woods there, they told him he liked smoking, he wanted to smoke. I asked him, do you want to smoke? Yeah, you can't smoke in my car, get out. When we were out, he stood there for a while. He stood there maybe from 10.30 until 1.30. That's, I don't know, with me. I don't know, something is wrong. I was even with Jackie. I didn't come in and through there. We stayed for an hour talking. I mean, you really are bad if you stay with the person for an hour talking to them, and then it's still true. Like, something is wrong somewhere. I think, I don't know how to do that. It's easier maybe to come in and ambush a person and kill them and run, but sit down with them, get to know them, but then still decide. It's terrible, really. So I talked to him, we walked in the woods there. The hunter came when I had a gun and had out pointing at him. The hunter didn't see it, I hit it quickly. And he relaxed, that was relaxed. Why well, have a gun? He's relaxed. He knows I'm not going to kill him. Right. You know, he knows that I trust him, maybe not going to kill him, I know. And I made it clear to him, I'm angry with you because your friends did this to me. Like, I, they didn't tell me they would do that to you. I didn't know they would do that to you. They said they just, they just, just wanted to rough you up and stuff. I didn't know they would abuse you and all that. You know, you know, I'm trying to get angry at him so that I can find a reason to shoot him. Because you can't just shoot a person, you know. Um, standing there, man, I just shot him. I shot him once. I mean, I shot him at first. I didn't see blood anymore, and he fell, and I thought maybe it's was of the he had the shot, being fired, he's scared. Then I came close and I shot him with the chest. And then I saw blood coming out of his mouth, and dogs barking, and I thought, no, oh, they'll find me. I ran. That was the worst day of my life, I think. Well, that was one day worst day of my life. The worst day of my life was the following Friday, but that was terrible. What I did there, from a person who have known for two and a half years, a friend of mine, I cared about a lot. That was bad, man. That was terrible. When I drove to Indiana, through Indiana to St. Louis, slept in St. Louis, drove the next day, Sunday, to Oklahoma, drove on President's Day to Clovis, set up an account, got a tenant's lease form. Because that's all you needed. New York's going to need a tenant's lease form and get an account to have that in. Got it set up, getting ready to get my driver's license. Well, I already knew how to drive, so that would not have been a problem. Then I, I don't know, are you the one who was on video, was on TV news, I think? Are you? Probably. Yeah, I think you were. You know, thought you had a hat there. But the face looked familiar. I may, think. may have. May have. I don't, I, yeah, I think I've seen it before. I don't know. I don't know if it's you, but I, I, I may be wrong. But there was this guy on TV you know, appealing to people to identify this guy. You know, it's frustrating. It's after about eight hours. With, uh, you, you look, yeah. We've not, we've not even identified the guy. Now, the plan was to steal all his IDs so that he, he will never be identified. I knew he, his parents are in South Africa, nobody would ever even report him missing. But I didn't count on the guy having a tattoo. That messed it up. Because if the guy didn't have a tattoo, nobody would ever ID the guy, so I can leave as him. And I can continue emailing, man, it's bad when I was bad. See now, it's terrible. How can a person hatch such evil? Because I was going to continue as, his, as him on the, on, the, on the emails, emailing his parents as him. I was going to take over his life. Yeah. That is Satan, really. And then I hear he's got a tattoo. My God. I remember I was in that hotel in Clovis and he's got a tattoo. He, of all the things you can put on yourself as a tattoo, you put your name, not a rose, not a snake. You put your name. Man, my world came down shredding. I tell you, I was, I was paranoid looking at the windows. Oh my God, maybe the cops, maybe they know I'm here already. I knew then and then, I'm smart enough to know you can't use this anymore. I didn't know how far you went, I don't know you, but I, I, I knew you could, you or the coroner could report 
to the Social Security Administration. This security number is now void. This person is dead. So I didn't know whether I could still continue using it. What if I use it? Then they pick it up. This is a dead person's security number. And my name is on the license. Right now, they don't know who killed him. They will look at this. Who, who got an ID under this name? Oh, this is the guy we're looking for. My pictures will be, will, will be everywhere. U.S. Marshals, Manhattan, looking for me. I called it off. At the same time, Governor Martinez of New Mexico had already taken a bill to the House of Representatives there to say license should not be issued to aliens anyway. So it was two reasons I could not continue. I didn't know there was a Senate that would overwrite whatever she had said later. When you guys came up with the name on Friday or whatever day it was, I packed and left immediately from close because I, I, I didn't know how much you knew. I didn't know whether the fact that his name has been used to open an account in New Mexico. I don't know if you guys could pick that up on the system. I didn't know. I, I didn't know whether you were on the way here or if state police in New Mexico were already coming. I packed and left. That's how it happened with that. And it's sad, really, as I said, man. My life is messed up. It's messed up. I'm, I'm not using it as an excuse, but I doubt that if I had got up a normal kid, I would be able to do these things I'm doing. Okay? Well, those, those things, from my experience, when you're abused as a child, mm. unfortunately, they stay with you forever. Which is sad. They and can. they affect you forever. And it never goes away. And um, I've had numerous occasions dealing with those victims. And uh, it affects people differently and, and it changes you. It really does. And, uh, and I can see with you, just in the short time that I've been sitting here talking with you, that, uh, you know, uh, you're a very intelligent person, very well versed. Did a lot of research, looking into things. Uh, very good at that. Very good at that. Um, uh, there's a few things that I would like to add on. I mean, we, you did you did wonderful. I appreciate that. I really do appreciate that. Uh, I know it's got to be difficult for you under the circumstance uh, involved with that. Um, what was Zen's Facebook name that he used that you were able to contact him through? Do you remember? Yeah, Zen. Zen. Da, da, Zen. D. Zen. D. No, Zen space D. Okay. Zen space D. Space da da M D A. D A N E space Roman figure two I I is in the second. All right, that's his Facebook name. Okay. Um. And you you talked a little bit about when you decided that you wanted to kill them. Yeah. Um. And why? And obviously, I mean, you had, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a, a term, maybe a, a little bit of a drive where you're, you contacted a online detective to try to find him and locate him. Is that how you ended up finding him in Hans, Huntsville? No, Huntsville, it was my own research. Okay. Not that just. Finding in Huntsville was me just being rel relentless or using search online, search, you know, online searches, websites, and phone trackers and reverse numbers. I did. I invested a lot of time using my laptop searching for him myself until I found. I knew that he was in Alabama, Huntsville, but I didn't have a specific address. Then I called his parents, which is shameful, and lied to be some university lawyer who try, is trying to help their son, where is he? So they gave me the, the exact address where they thought he was, but they didn't know he had moved him on earlier. Okay. Then after I had failed to locate him in Alabama, I came back and thought, let me solicit services of trained people. 
then I went online and looked at all these detective services that are available online. They chose one that was the cheapest to charge me only three hundred and fifty dollars, which was very cheap. Because most of them were well, wanted crazy money, which I didn't have. And I got these guys, and these guys found him in East Brunswick and confirmed that he was there. They spoke to him while I was on the dead phone, on the dead line. They didn't, because I lied to them. I didn't tell them what I was going to do. It's like he's my cousin. I, I, I meet him. I miss him. Whatever. Okay. And then you, you actually went to East Brunswick. To no. I didn't go. You didn't go? I was about to go, but it wasn't already hired the Lexus for me to drive all the way there when I decided to call before I left the Independence, Missouri. I thought, this is a 17-hour drive. If you go there for nothing. So I called, and I pretended to be his brother. I went to talk to this guy. Oh, this guy checked out this morning. Do you remember what hotel that was? By yeah, that, yeah, that was Motel 6. Motel 6. Route 18, this was in New Jersey, zero something. Right. I didn't go there though, okay. but, but, but I was planning to go. He just, he just beat me. Oh. Then you made contact with him Facebook? Mm -hmm. To and email. strike up an, an yeah. email? To see. Yeah. Which email account did you use? Do you remember? Z. Davis. M. At gmail.com. That's the one that I have. That's the one you have? I have, yeah. I found that one. Well, very recently I found that one. Well, um, so you were able to get back into being friends, if you would, or back into contact uh, by Facebook and by Gmail at that point. Uh, can I ask the question that? This is one question that has lived with me for uh, what, over a month now that um, I just have to ask, how did you pick Dayton, Ohio? Hmm. I picked Dayton, Ohio because I was in Ohio to to, to rob Jay. Because, okay, he was coming to Iowa. I was in Iowa. I had booked a ticket for him to come to Iowa. I was going to do him in Iowa. But while in Iowa, Victor, Jackie's husband, or Jackie's boyfriend, whatever he is, calls me on, on, on a Tuesday after Valentine's Day, so that's February 15th, telling me on Thursday he's going to Michigan. So I'm thinking, when I'm coming back, he says he's coming back on the 18th Friday. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, I need money to survive in New Mexico. This is an opportunity to go to Ohio, rob Jackie the money in the safe. I remember at first I was planning to go to Ohio, rob Jackie on a Thursday evening, drive all the way on Friday to Iowa and wait for Zen there to arrive on a Sunday morning. But then I changed my mind. I thought that this is a waste of gas going back to Iowa, driving back to Iowa on a Friday morning the whole day. I need to just wait for them in Dayton. That's how I chose Dayton, really. Okay. He was coming to Iowa, though. I'm, I'm sure I would have made it easy for you. So, but he was coming to Iowa, but because Akron was in Ohio, I thought, stay in Ohio Saturday, Friday, and do. And I remember 30 calls to Greyhound trying to get them to jump off in Dayton to what with Iowa. So that's how we came to Dayton, really. It was by that chance. And you said you purchased the Greyhound ticket for yeah. Zen? Where did you purchase that? Online. Online. Greyhound website. It's a my card. Okay. Uh, so you picked him up in the, at, you actually picked him up that Saturday at the Greyhound bus stop in Tower 10. Uh, 15. Right. Is next to a Speedway gas station, I think. I don't know. Uh, there's a Sears on the other side, I know, because I had taken my car to Sears. Sears. Okay. Yeah, close to that station. I, I, I don't remember my Speedway. You took your car to Sears? I got some work done? Yeah, the day before, Friday. In Friday. At Sears, and then on Saturday. Because I, I could not find the station, so I had to go to Sears, ask them where the station they showed me. So I got the job done on the car Friday, 
Not Saturday, they give them under about fifty mile better. Okay. So they want Saturday one. And, and you and you selected that location prior to Zen arriving here and Zen driving around. And, and you selected that or were you then driving around with Zen and just no, found I, that location? No, I had fit early. I had left early the hotel. I was I slept over there day two. The, the blue one. Super eight or one of the two, I think it was one eight. Slept in the eight train motor six, I think it was eight, it was one eight. I had woken up in the morning to pick it. I had driven for two hours, maybe from eight to ten. I was a bit late to pick him up because I could not find a place. Every the, the, every that place is has open aircrafts everywhere, you can't hide anyone. So I found it at the end. So I just took him to a place where, which a location which I had served on my GPS and find it down which GPS for. I found it at the end before I went to pick him up. Okay. That's the worst day, man. I mean the contrast in me, don't do it. Do it. Get desperate. If you don't do it, you're losing your job. And that's called who stops you. Takes your license, your parents, think of your family. That was the most selfish act I've ever done. I mean, JG, it was terrible, but I had not planned it. You don't understand the torture I went through for that, was I planned it. Not for hours, for days, weeks. Then you know this person is not a stranger, you know him, and you know he's got family. I'm supposed to be looking out for him, he's my younger brother, you know. All those things came back to me, I felt like, Cain killing Abel. This is. This guy trusts me. I mean, he even said it on the image that I'll come once I trust to end that mail. Do you remember reading that email or text? He said, I'll come once I trust him. Oh, Zen, don't trust me. If you know Zen. This guy trusts me. Even when I had a gun, he didn't run away because he trusted me. But I'm kidding. And you've been doing this for months. It's not like then you continue with it. That tortures me. That's the only of the four killings. I was two years ago, I was defending myself, but I would have died there if I didn't kill those boys. JG, man, I was afraid she would report me to the cops. Then what there was, well, it was Robert I did. But then you don't understand the pain, um, the torture. It has tortured me ever. It tortured me before I did it, because I, I planned it. You know, you go to bed, you think something like that, that terrible effort. And since then, it has tortured me. Lord. Thinking about his family, he can write a newspaper and after all he's dead, I was talking, saying the investigation was still going on. Not saying they're trying to sound pride, proud or arrogant, but I was confident the way I had done it, that it would be hard for you guys to get me. Maybe I was wrong, but I was confident the way I had planned it. It would be, it won't be just the walk in the, because I knew nobody would. My key was I told nobody. So, Unless I talk, nobody will say anything. Fair ones. But it ate me day and night. That's why that ate me day and night. I still see his pictures in my mind, him lying down there. It's unbelievable, man. What kind of. And, and you ended up. Your boss bought the gun for you in Independence? Was that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And. That day, on the 19th, when you drove out uh, on Frederick Pike, and uh, you said that you used Zen smoking the get him out of the car, get him out of the car, and get him over to that into that little I don't want to say wooded area, but that little clump of trees, basically, where, uh, where we found him. Uh, at that point. Did Zen have his idea on him, or did he have a, a you were talking about you, and you got his uh, visa and the passport, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Was it on him, did he have a bag, or did he have a computer, did he have other belongings with him that day? He had a bag, and a fine, and everything. I, I, I had told him to bring all his papers, because he was meeting with Jewish family and they would want to see everything about him. So he had all his paperwork in the file. He was a local nice boy. Very untidy, but very local. So if 
fairly unclean personal, personal hygiene, not bad, but everything else was in order. <laughs> so he had his bag, clothing, and his fine, and everything was in the fine. I was not much, I didn't mark him, I didn't shoot him and then look for pain, because everything was in the fine. I had told him to put it in a fine, was we were going to some kind of presentation. Because I didn't want blood, they would, when we're bleeding, I'm looking at somebody comes and see me marking a dead person or something. So he had put everything beforehand in a fight. Okay. And while you were in Zen, while you were in Zen, were outside the van. An hunter came. A hunter came? With a dog, a white hunter. And I had a gun at him. I think I saw the hunter first, because I think if the hunter had seen the gun, he would have reacted differently. I think I saw him first and he hit the gun, inside my jacket, and the hunter came and asked us, are you guys all right here? Yeah, yeah, he walked around and he went away. <clears throat> I don't know. I, I think he didn't see the gun one. Uh, I thought if he had seen it, he would have acted differently and maybe... But after the hunter saw us, we were there for another 90 minutes. So I thought if, he, if that guy had seen the gun, he would have called cops now, they would have called him and whatever. So they had to take to the gun. And once we knew each other, then the hunter would not have suspected anything. It's not like Zenon was not under any duress. You trust that me, he was not showing signs of this guy has a gun, he's gonna kill me. He knew I was not gonna kill him. And I can try to kill him. Did that hunter come forward? Yes, he did. Did he give you a sketch of me or something? Could he come up with a drawing? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good description. Uh, fairly good. I mean, I can say a fairly good drawing. Uh, he had some, uh, after, needless to say, after Zen was found that day, and later that evening, he saw it on the news and ended up calling the police department. He was um, shaken because he put himself in that it's a crime scene. No, he put himself in would he have killed me? And you know that that has that sobering effect or that wake up attention and you know he says if I would have been there a minute earlier, or two minutes later, when I had been laying there in the field too, if I would have walked up as whatever transpired happened and, and he was shot, would I have gotten shot too? So he had he had some um, emotional baggage, and he still does from that. Uh, I spoke to him uh, about a week and a half ago, heading to the police department. We were, doing some things concerning this and you know when he talked about it you could see the emotions starting to come up and, and uh, he was very thankful uh, that he walked away that day he was very thankful that he walked away that day so did they did tell you what car they driving mm -hmm. didn't give you a license number but real good description on the vehicle i knew the car he would figure out but i knew the license then you will not have noticed it. Did I have dreadlocks in his description? I'm trying to remember back because uh, the ranger asked me and I don't remember because the initial contact uh, that day on the 19th, <clears throat> I was not there. Uh, I was out of town and I was not there so I did not have I did not speak to our witness for probably over a week and, and it was getting some other details. I let uh, one of our detectives pretty much deal with him and actually our, my chief uh, had uh, met with him the day on the 19th and uh, struck up a good rapport with him and, and they have a good working relationship between the two. But like I said, he is very thankful that uh, he walked away that day. Walked away. Um, See, going through all my little questions. Okay. Uh, so, have you guys by any chance picked up that that's name had been used after his death in New Mexico at all? 
We'll talk about that at the end of this. <laughs> How's that? Uh, we, uh, I will tell you, and uh, this is, I've done this job for 31 years, so I'm a real old man, and uh, or I feel real old. But I've done this job for about 31 years, and I will tell you that the homicides that I've investigated and assisted with and supervised, and uh, you made me work. You have made me work the hardest in my 31 years of trying to identify people, trying to identify Zen, trying to look back and find out what he did for two and a half years that he was in the United States, where he'd been, who his friends were, where he were, um, uh, all that for two and a half years, let me tell you. Plus that then? A lot of work. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot of work to go back. Did he come up as one of his friends or something? Um, uh, not as of yet. No, I'll be honest with you. I'm not going to lie to you. No. Um, but how we, did you guys identify him? How did the tattoo link to his name? I know his name was was there, but how did you then end up saying Zenzel and Tata and whatever from South Africa? How did that happen? Well, actually, and again, we're being honest with one another. The tattoo on his chest was uh, a clue but how we eventually did identify him uh, was through fingerprints through homeland security and immigration and but the tattoo was the confirmation uh, of when uh, the coroner's office spoke to his parents and then later that same day when we made the identification when I spoke to his parents, I spoke to and originally to his mother, and then I spoke to his father, um, and that was our confirmation for sure. Uh, because you always have with, especially fingerprints. Um, for me, my my biggest nightmare is a wrong identification, <laughs> wrong identification to a family, and. Uh, we confirmed it and we knew it was him. Uh, and then at that point in time, we really started our investigation of backtracking where Zen had been, who his friends were, where he had worked, uh, all of that to lead us backwards to figure out where it happened, uh, what had happened, why it had happened. Uh, I had so, the best that was even the emails I had used to him. I was not using my own emails. I actually created a lot of bogus email addresses that could not be easily traced back to me and stuff. So I had made sure that I had done my research a long, for a long time to make sure that nothing was coming back to me at all. What email addresses the bogus ones? Do you remember any of those? No, there was only uh, some under six flags. I had managed to do things. Also, I have a degree in electronics, so uh, I had managed to do things that I, I didn't know I could do. Zen, looking for Zen, got me very creative and I got to see I could do things I never knew I could. Like I could create email addresses under the server Six Flags, ICE, US government, and I could, uh, things that I knew I could not do before, but I, when I was hunting for Zen, I, I managed to think of ways to get the system and come up with all those things, which I knew it would not be the easiest thing to trace back to me as a person. And you know what, I, I'm just glad this is over and done with. But I was planning to hide from you guys and run away, and I was confident I could for years. But now I'm caught, I'm better. Well, when they called me, they wanted, they were interested in New Mexico, but I told them, you know what, let me just tell you other things, man. Just get this out of my, of my chest, give that family a closure. I used to be a Christian, I want to go back to Christianity now, get my life back to God. And just, you know, I feel sorry for both families have lost their sons. Zen's family have lost their son. My family have lost me too, because now I, I, you will go to court and say, sentence them to death, which is what I'm hoping for, really, because 
that what, what, what is life worth if I'm going to be jailed? I'm only 33. It's not that sentence, it will be what? Life without parole because of this cold blooded animal. You live there till you're 80, that in jail. It's, it's better just to the, the injection. I know I have an injection. I don't know how, I don't know how, what people will say. It was self defense. But I know when I'm done in Newark, I have to come to Ohio, face the music there. And I'm hoping, I told the guys from Actress, I'm hoping I get that penalty there. I'm hoping I just check out, I just die. Because it's not like I will ever get out. If, if I don't die, I know I'm getting life without parole anyway. So why postpone death for about 50 years? That's how I look at it. Why postpone it to 2070? When I can die now, the same death that I will die then, you know? That does not mean that I'm suicidal. I'm, not, I'm never going to kill myself. Um, I also know if I kill myself, I'll go to hell or something. But I hope you guys kill me. I really am. Well, I think I deserve death to be this one I've done, especially to this guy. This is one guy that I deserve death for. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I took. I took life. I, my life would be taken as well. Then I took a life that didn't deserve it. It's not like he robbed me. I mean, he owed me some money, he did that. But he was drunk and he didn't know those guys were going to do that to me. So it's not like he deserved it. It's not like he had it coming. I, I just was evil. Cold as cold can be. And it's shameful what I did, you know. And my concern is if I didn't get stopped, I can see that I could have done it again. Because I had broken that barrier, I had done it first time. Once you do it first time, I think you can do it more more times. I think you can do it again. The other time is the first time, I know. But I think after breaking that barrier, I, I would have done it. I would have found a reason to kill somebody else. So I'm glad I'm not killing people out there. I'm glad I'm here. I just want to get my life together. And Detective from Akron told me that that sentence takes time. It's years. You don't get sentence today and die tomorrow. They said you can be on death row for years. And those would be torturous, yes. And sometimes I think it's better to die on the day you know you're going to die. Then get your life right with God. You know, 2015, I'm dying. Do whatever it needs to be done. Get right with everyone you need to get right with. Get right with God. Die in peace. And go to heaven, hopefully. You know? Right. That's what I'm hoping for. Well, I want to... I'll say it right now because you mentioned it. I want to thank you for being so forthright and upfront because they can't have closure. And I appreciate that. I mean, that's a small amount that we can do. And it's us right now. This is us of we can give them closure. And um, that means a lot to people in their circumstance. And I do appreciate that. And to me, that shows that inner of Moosey and the inner self of you. Um, and like I said, I do appreciate that on everybody else. Uh, that means a lot because uh, it just does. You know, it's said that my death won't keep them back there. So, you know, yeah, that is one guy, for all the guys I know, that is one guy who was nine times better than me. In the not not in, a, in an envy way. I didn't envy him. It's not like I killed him for envy. That guy was smart. Yeah, he, he had unfortunately he had he had bad company when it comes to alcohol and smoking and I don't know what else. But that guy was smart. That guy would have been very productive. I stole. I didn't rob his family only. I robbed this world of. The person who would have bettered them. That man was smart, he was creative, he was fun loving. He was far better than me as a, as a man. The world is, is, is poorer after his death than it would have been after mine. He, he was seven times a man more than me. He was. He deserved to live his life to the fullest and die in the old age. Was This world would have benefited a lot. Well, I see sitting in front of me a man who had a lot to offer, who was very intelligent, and due to some circumstances um, brought him to this. 
and that's unfortunate. Very unfortunate. Very. Um, you still had, I think, when you were stopped, you still had the the gun that you killed Zen with. Mm. Uh, you still had some of his belongings, I believe. Yeah, that was all of all of Zen's belongings were still in your your van. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, his laptop. No, he never had a laptop. He did not have a laptop. So he was to go to the library. Uh, his library card, you can check his email. He will say no, and, and text messages, he will say no, and no, I can't. Uh, my time in the library was running out on him. He never had a laptop. Okay. He preferred alcohol and small words, but he said that it's with his money that had to give him to. Okay. He never had a laptop. I had two laptops, so then they think maybe one is his, no. I just bought one last week, because I was planning to get rid of the old one before I got me. Then my direct V boss snitched on me. Now I'm here. Before I could get rid of Everything's meant to happen for a reason. Yeah, which is good. That is very cool what my boss did. Okay, I hated him when he did it, but after sitting here thinking, I love my boss boss. He had, I know why he snitched on me. He, he didn't, he, he, he reached a stage where he didn't trust me himself, where I could have killed him. He thought, and I know I could have must have thought of it, which is sad. Like he was, he would cheat with my money. He used to cheat me a lot, money wise. And I, I was thinking, well, if you don't give me my money, dude, and because yeah. I used to tell him, he used to think I was threatening. Now when he saw him, this guy can really do these things, this guy gonna kill me. So he got rid of me, but he helped me. I love my boss. He helped me because I was going to go on this road, and I was going to die doing this thing. Somebody would have killed me too. I would have died in this, and with all these secrets, and I would have gone to hell the worst part, which I don't want to go to. Um, it's too um, Let's see. No. Um, the shell casings, do you remember what you did with those? My boss has them. My direct TV boss has them. Your direct TV has the, the spent shell casings I gave them to him last week, uh, Tuesday. He's got them. And what's your boss's name? Joshua Simons. Simons, and that's in Houston. He's here in Houston. Houston. Here in Houston. He's got them. All five of them: the three for Jackie and two for for them. Did you tell him where they came from? He knows. He knows. Okay. He, he, he does not know the extreme details, but I told him one lady. I said these are from Ohio, one lady and one guy from Africa. That's all you know. But I said always the ones. I made him I gave them to him and he's got them. The two from New Mexico, they are still in my gun. I'm sure they just got them. And what was Joshua's last name again? Simon, so Simon, S I M O L S. Do you know his phone number off the top? Not off the top, I know it's a two eight one number, but off the top. Two eight two eight one six five six. If you go on my phones You'll find me. Okay. He's Josh. He's under Josh. He's your drug TV boss. Yeah, he's got the show faces. Josh also is the one. That, Josh is not the one. He's, he's the, the one. He's the one that bought the gun one for me. three fifty. I got it. That got me the gun. Okay. Let me make sure of that. Um, after, let's see, have you ever, I think at one point you said you had talked to Zen's, you called Zen's family, is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Asking where he was or something. Um, did you, uh, at any point before this, uh, and I'm going back from my recollection too, of, um, did you talk to his mom and ask about money or saying he needed money or anything that you remember? Before when, before he died? Yes. Before then died? Yes. No. Okay. okay. Did you have any contact with him afterwards? Email or telephone yeah. or anything? Not, not telephone, email, because I was still pretending to be him. So I was him, so I had to continue with whatever conversations he had left. And, um, 
I'm a hacker, so I'm going to the internet, so I, I helped the girls, I could make yours if I knew what yours was. I tried to, but I was looking for a wrong man, rich boy. <laughs> You can't trust the news media, they always make a mistake. Yeah, they, they let me down. I was trying to see what you were up to. So I, had that I, was, I was really surprised that you didn't, uh, for all of your researching, which was pretty pretty good, I could have used your help. Uh, but seriously, seriously. Uh, but in all of your researching, I was surprised that you didn't. Did you ever go to our uh, website? Did you? Yes. Okay. Crime Stoppers and Interceder, all those websites, I think. Okay. I don't know, you talk about those or another one? Did you talk, did you actually go to like our police department website? I've gone to so many, so many. Crime, Crime Stoppers, Interceder, uh, there's another one, I don't know what it's called. I've gone, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a crime that I didn't spend much time looking at because I was confident that a crime they could hardly link me to anything. But I knew if you guys looked carefully at things, I knew that you could not link it to me until New Mexico. I was wondering about New Mexico. Then I had used this name. I thought if they could figure out that I've used this name in New Mexico, they could go to the bank and open an account and just see me there. Video there, he is opening an account and now that person's name. That's why my concern was. That's why I was spending a lot of my time looking at you guys. And also the guilt, you know. Because I had planned this. What bank did you open an account? What was the name? No, Citizen. What is it called? Citizen's Bank. They have the information there in the car, these guys. Okay. Citizen's so Bank in New Mexico? At Clovis. It's called Clovis. Citizen's Bank of Clovis. Is that the only place that you did use Zen's name? And the hotel. Uh, one six one six Library Drive M A R P Y. Or is it is it B Is that in Clovis too? M A Library M A B R Y Drive Clovis. It's an American Inn and Swiss hotel. Those are the only two places I've used since the day. Okay. I was telling the detectives from the age you know. While waiting for you guys to kill me, I was thinking I want to study. There is a way to study in jail. Mm -hmm. I want to study. I was, my life is messed up. When I was a kid, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Okay, that was my burning desire to be a lawyer. But my dad was a Christian, Christian, still is. Mine too. Okay, <laughs> he would say lawyers are liars. My son cannot be a lawyer, so he's the one who told me to become an engineer. But I've always had passion for law, you know. Even, even now, I'm, I'm committing all these things and I know uh, how to use cell phones and don't leave and create all these bogus events. Because I've always had passion for that and I've, I watch a lot of these detect, forensic detectives, FBI files, 48 hours, a lot like religion. But right? every day I know, you know, I mentioned justice, court cases and all that. Man, I'm already 33, I don't know my dream. I've always wanted to be a lawyer. I'm thinking that if I go to jail while I'm waiting to be killed, maybe that's what I need to do. Maybe I need to study there. Who knows? Maybe you guys will use me. You would, be, you would not be the first person who has done that. I know that for a fact. You would not be the first person who has done that. We had a actually a person on death row in the state of Ohio who earned his a law degree and passed the bar while he was on death row. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that is that Um Yes, I believe he is. But he he was able to accomplish that. Ohio is cruel. When it, once once a guy gets a degree like that, you tell flip him over. You guys could use him. Why don't you kill him still? <sighs> Get, you know, you said you and uh, you would have discussions about politics and things. We could literally, if we had the time, me and you could sit here and discuss uh, the politics of uh, the death penalty and not death penalty and my feelings and your feelings and society's feelings and, and does it work or not work. We could probably sit here for two or three days between the two of us discussing that. Uh, 
And uh, you know, sometime in the future, maybe we'll have that talk. Yeah. We'll have that. that I, don't, I, don't believe, I don't believe in that. But I'm glad. I don't believe in it at all. But I'm glad in my case that it exists because I think it's my way out. But it does not. I don't think it, it does any good. I, I think people should, should be rehabilitated more than, okay, they should be punished, but give them a chance to change. Well, and I agree. And the one thing that I see with you is I think you could be an asset. I hope so. I think you could be an asset for other people of, yeah. you know, here, don't. And uh, I think you could do some good. I really believe. Yeah. I really believe that you could do some good. I mean, for, for 33 years, eight months, I've been doing a lot of good. And it's just that last six weeks that I've just flipped over. I think the anger that I've got leading me of all the abuse I was going up, and I didn't deal with it. I was brought up in a village, no counseling, no psychological attention. No, you're putting all this anger within you. And then in some stage, it just comes out. Beautiful. But I think, yeah, I know I put through it. It happens. Unfortunately, it happens. And unfortunately, we're sitting here with that. Yeah. I'd love to have met you under better circumstances. I think we could have had some really good long discussions. <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. um, let's see. So you did. You did have some email contact with Zen's family. Did you use the the million dollar million dollar boys account to contact? To continue that you were saying. Yeah, but I stopped it. As soon as, as soon as I realized they knew he was dead, I stopped. Because I knew you guys would trace it uh, through IP addresses and stuff. So I knew not to do it anymore. And one of them, I changed my IP address and I bought a, a UK address. I bought online in, in, in London IP address. So that when you try to trace me, it will take you off to Europe while I'm in Mexico. So I stopped. Once I knew they know he's dead, well, I, I, I think, I may be wrong, I think, I think, I may be wrong. I think either you guys told them to keep, to continue contacting this podcast then, or they decided to pretend, well, they will pretend as though they don't know he's dead, mm -hmm. both his mom and then at least once he's dead. What's his mom? They would write to me as though they think I'm Zen. And I thought, oh, this is a setup now. If I continue this relations with these people, the detectives with dating could say to these guys, cut us the heading and send us so that we can trace this guy through the IP address and we will know where he is. But, and this is, I'm, of course I'm clearing my chest and everything, but you could not, when I was in Clovis, you could not trace me in that hotel. Now I made a mistake and emailed them while I was in McDonald's and I realized later that I had not hidden my IP address in McDonald's. So you could trace me up to McDonald's, but the exact hotel, I had found a loophole uh, where it would appear that I was in Clayton, New Mexico, which is three hours away than where I was from. So I had set it up such that if you had tried to trace me in Clovis at that hotel, you will pitch me and you will think I'll be in Clayton, New Mexico, yet I'm not there. Well, that, that was very good. Uh, and you're probably, about your suspicions, correct. Yeah, I thought so. You were probably correct. That's why I stopped. I thought, well, oh, you, you better stop this. They are, they are on to you. Uh, let's see. Um, my big question you already answered. Uh, I do have one for you. There was one um, that the Rangers uh, had mentioned and it just piqued my curiosity is that um, I guess at your hotel room that you had here, there was some duct tape wadded up in a trash can. What was, what was that from? Ah, uh, just my then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they are watching, okay, so they can hear this. That, that man, I'm, you know, I'm surprised. These people think I'm this. 
Okay, I know I'm missing. I can't because I've killed more than one person. But now they think I have a stone in Oklahoma. I have 18 bodies there. Um, what? What? What is it called? That the river guy, the blue river man, and all of them. I'm not. Okay. Okay. That that team. If you if they go back to my hotel room, they will find a box, a black box, mm -hmm. where the laptop was when I bought it. I had taken those things that uh, it, that were found, the evidence that was in the bag that I was trying to get rid of. I had put it inside the computer box. So I had used that duct tape to seal the box. So that if I move the evidence, it will be sealed. It does not spill over. Okay, gotcha. Then I changed my mind. I decided I will use that box in the hotel room as part of my trash system. And I was going to use a trash bag to dispose of the evidence. So I had to take the duct tape off the box and then I threw it away so that I could I use to put the evidence in the trash bag. Uh, but That's all right. Uh, they actually, when they mentioned that it piqued my curiosity, in, you were talking I don't about do that. I know I have a duct tape and a knife, but I use that for direct TV at the, the, the same time. I don't do we, that. We, That's why everybody that you found was not bound. Right. We pretty much, we pretty much figured that, but I, had, that, I don't was do a, that. that was a curious question that I had to ask. Uh, and you said you were, tr you were wanting to get rid of some evidence. Was that evidence? I was trying to get rid of all the evidence. Okay, even Zen was Zen's and everything? Yes, I was trying to get rid of Zen and New Mexico. There was not much on Jake. But uh, yes, I was trying to get rid of it. Okay. Shame on me, I was. I was trying to get away with four matters. And that would have seen my fate in hell. That would have seen my, head, my fate in hell. Now, you can, Jesus says, how will it benefit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? I would have gained the world. I watched these programs and resolved mysteries where there are still outstanding men that are never committed 30 years ago, 50 years ago. I would have been one of the legends who would have gotten away with it, maybe. I don't know how long, but for as long as I could have. And even if I had gotten caught without that evidence, the evidence that I was in the back, there's no way you would have pinned anything on me. The stuff I wanted to get rid of. But, and it would have been harder, even if I had a change of heart, 10 years down the line, if I came to you and said I did this, without that evidence, you would have, you would have thought, oh, you are a glory seeker, you read, you read online, where is the proof? So in other words, I would have gotten away with it, but I would not have gotten away with it with God. Right. You know? When? I would not have gotten, I was still in this world and taking a shower, I'm in jail now. And this is easy compared to where I'm going in prison, I know. In prison, I will, it will be hell, almost. But it's nothing compared to real hell. It's not the same. So you rather face your music here. Whatever happens, if I die in jail, I die in jail. If I don't, I don't. Whatever happens, happens, man. But at least you know that your eternity is taken care of. You know, your next life is taken care of. It's a shame. I feel sorry for my parents. The same way that I feel sorry for his parents. They lost a son, a very promising son, who would have made a lot of difference in people's lives. My parents have lost a son too. Right. I can't feed them now, I can't take care of them now. Oof. I hope not to see them, because they'll be shamed. I think that, uh, I think in the future, like I said, number one, I still think you have a lot of positives that you can do left in your life. Uh, I can see that in you. Uh, it just, it, it's almost glowing that you can um, have some positive impact still in the future. And I believe that you can do that. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not real familiar with the New Mexico case and what they're wanting to do. I, that's, you know, that's not of, uh, out of my, my hands patrol or anything else I'm worried about. Butler Township and, and the incident was in. Uh, I know that uh, from our standpoint, I'll put the, our case together, uh, the information that I've gained from you, information that I've already had in the works, uh, and put a package together and present it to our prosecutor and see what happens at that point in time, what we, what charges we would look at well, you facing in Montgomery County. Uh, you're in Montgomery County here, and you'll go to Montgomery County in Ohio. <laughs> Uh, same, same name, uh, but you'll you'll face that there. Uh, could have been some It could have been Montgomery County, Alabama, if I found him there. Where Montgomery keeps chasing me everywhere. Uh, 
you know, there's a lot of them around. Uh, but, you know, and, and uh, I don't know how it would go. I know that I'll review it with prosecutors. We'll see what happens. I don't know. I don't know, like I said, I don't know much about the New Mexico case. I don't know how long of a process that will be. I don't know if Akron will try to uh, be the next step after New Mexico. I don't know. That'll be worked out between the, the prosecutors, the, the people with the law degrees. They just work that out uh, and uh, do it that way. Uh, I don't even know when, uh, you know, I may get to see it again. I really don't. Uh, I don't know when you'll be in Ohio. I can't predict that. I'm sure that maybe you're going to have that as a question. I don't know because I don't know the process and how long things will take to New Mexico. And then once they're done in New Mexico, at some point in time, there'll be a decision made between, uh, I can't remember the county, Summit County, I think, maybe Summit County in Akron and Montgomery County in Ohio, who will take, take the next case. Uh, and how it will proceed from there. I, I can't answer that right now. Okay. Uh, I will keep, uh, you know, but, keep uh, track of things mm. in you. Uh, yes. If I plead guilty, I don't know, let's say this is first degree murder, I'll make an example. I like to think that Akron was involuntary manslaughter or second degree murder, whatever you look at it, however you look at it. But this obviously is first degree murder, and I premeditated on it. And I had hundred chances to quit. I didn't. Was you know? Now, first degree murder in Ohio law by law carries death penalty, right? It can. It's uh, you know, and most states have an out, if you would. In the state of Ohio, you can have um, what is called aggravated murder which uh, there are certain criteria that you have to meet for it to be an aggravated murder. And then there's murder. And aggravated murder can carry the death penalty, uh, but it's, uh, there are certain criteria that has to be met. And that's something that the prosecutor would, would want to uh, consider would be the death penalty or life without parole or a murder charge versus an aggravated murder charge. Uh, that's something that prosecutor and people with law degrees will have to sit down and look at everything that we have as far as evidence, um, hear what you had to say and what you had to tell me, and piece together everything and determine if that what happened was then meets the qualifications and the criteria for number one, aggravated murder, and then number two, would it meet and rise to the specifications of a death penalty case. Okay. The question number two is, <clears throat> what's the average period between being sentenced to death and the execution of death normally in Ohio? I would have to guess. If you want me to guess, I can yeah. guess, but I, I don't know. The specifics? I don't know the specifics of it. I could not sit here and say it's seven years and nine months or 15 years and nine months or 35 years um guess i would say in the 10 to 15 year range what are they waiting for well there's a lot of protections that are afforded to people that who do receive a death penalty uh, automatic protections automatic appeals to uh, state Supreme Court to U.S. District Supreme or U.S. What if I don't want any of that? Can I say I don't want? Uh, can I go to court and say I I am guilty and I want to be killed? I want death penalty, uh, and I waive everything. Kill me now. It's just like everything else. You have a right to say what you want. It's your life. Yeah. You can you can make that choice if that's what you choose to do in the future. You can make that and make that wanted to. Um, prosecutors, attorneys, whoever, you can do that. That is, in my opinion, that is your choice. It's just like, you know, today I explained to you Miranda warning and said, you know, you, you can talk to me or not talk to me. It's your choice. And as far as that, I believe that is a person's choice. I believe that that is a person's choice. Uh, and you can convey that to 
like I said, either the prosecutor and in, in Ohio it's called prosecuting attorney. A prosecuting attorney for us or for Akron, depending on I don't know what they're going to charge you with or try to charge you with, or uh, attorneys that will be uh, at some point in time appointed for you to represent your people that you want to hire uh, in the future. They will all do that, but you have. It is your life, and it is you have a right to tell them how you feel and what you want. And that's my belief. Last one. Yes. Now, if I plead guilty from the start, is there a need for a case, a trial? Why is there a trial? Why, why torture the family having to sit and listen to all these extreme details here of my wickedness when I've just confessed to a murder? And why don't I just appear before a judge in his chambers and he sentenced me to life without parole or death penalty? Why do we have to sit through all the, these expensive, dramatic sessions in court? Um, most of it is for your protection to make sure that you're doing everything. Uh, and again, a lawyer at some time will explain all this to you as well as a judge. But to ensure that you're making very informed decisions. This, uh, our judges and lawyers uh, want to make sure that you know what you're doing. They want to make sure that, just like I, when I read you that form, I want to make sure you know what I'm doing and you're doing. You know, I don't trick people. I tell them the way it is and here it is. And that's the way our justice system is, is we want to make sure that you know what you're doing, you understand what you're doing, you understand that you have a right to a trial, you have a, you have a right to confront witnesses, you have all that. And that is guaranteed to you. That's why, you know, I, I will sit here and tell you that I, I've worked in the system 31 years and I believe in that system. And it's there for a reason. It's protect the innocent and it's protect those who have done wrong. Uh, but to make sure that they're treated fairly in the system. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, you talk about, and you know, you're, we were talking about our political, we could sit here and talk politics and different things. You know, that's what makes this country great, is that we make sure we protect those people's rights, whether you're the richest man or the poorest man or anywhere in between, that we protect those rights. And you know, without a doubt, what you're doing, you've got the best explanation and counseling that you can get and you're making informed decisions and that's why a lot of that is done. Well, and I was hoping it was of well, my admitted guilt. Uh, I was hoping they could just, you know. And nothing says, you know, again, I can't speak, you know, for the yeah, lawyers yeah, and the judges and prosecutors, but, you know, that is something that if it, when it gets to that, and as far as uh, our case, and you can you can say those things, you know, uh, but they're going to make sure that you make an informed decision. Even if you make a decision that that's what you want to do, they're going to make sure that you have an informed decision and you know what your rights are and your rights are protected. And okay. I, I know my rights. Believe me, I know my rights. I, I, this could have gone down the other way around if I want. I wanted it to exercise my right. I don't want to talk until I see a lawyer. I, want to, I know all that. So that I want, I want, I want my, I want my life to be clean now. Live for God. That's it. Yeah. So, and like I said, and you, I, you've heard me say it probably two times, maybe three. And you'll probably hear me say it again, and you'll hear me say it in the future. I appreciate what you did in your honesty and being up front with me. I really do. I appreciate it and I thank you on behalf of the family. Because uh, closure again means a lot. Um, and it helps. It doesn't cure everything, but it does help. And it does help with closure. I appreciate it. And I'm speaking for their family. I have not actually spoken to the family yet. We had a very quick conversation that I was coming here today. They don't know any any of the circumstances, uh, but I know uh, that they appreciate it as well because they they expressed to me that they did not want to be in the unknown forever.
they want to know what happened. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Do you have any other questions or anything for me? I'm losing it. I wish we could have met under better circumstances because you're a very interesting man. And with all your knowledge, you could help me in class. I could use the help in class. I really could use the help in class. I will go and speak to the Rangers, and I think. From airline that we covered, and I can't think of anything else. I want to take a quick look at my notes and make sure I didn't miss anything. And I'll be right back. Is there anything I can get for you? Anything you need? Anything? Okay. Thanks. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Technology's changed again. Everything's getting smaller. Yep. Both of us. Is this recording right now? It's on. It's okay. On. Okay. Flashing red light. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, Mr. Benali, remember to take a sing, take a brown. And a little over a year ago, we last spoke, and you wanted us something in writing that Ohio was going to seek the death penalty. Well, we're right. So. I'll let you read and see what what you want to do. Do you want us to scoot this closer to you a little bit? Yeah, we can. Right closer. Better? It's fine. It's scary. If you hit the center button, you bring up the screen again. Can you can see it. Okay. Yeah, we're good. I'll be glad to read that out. Lionel Fiddle, assist you. Man, you should read it out here in bed. What's that? Maybe somebody reads it aloud out here in bed. I'm trying to. Okay, okay. I'm not understanding the data and hit the connection. Well, I understand. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and put this, I'll, I'll read it completely verbatim here, okay? All right. It says, Mr. Madonda. It has come to my attention that you were interviewed by Detectives Brian Brown and Kevin Sink of the Butler Township Police Department regarding the death of Zanzeli Madande. Uh, Madane, didn't it? Madane. Madane, thank you. In Montgomery County, Ohio, on February 19, 2011. During your conversation with them, you indicated that you would tell them about your involvement and Mr. Madadne's death on the condition that the Summit County Prosecutor's Office indicate to you our intentions regarding the prosecution related to the killing of Jacqueline Howder in February 2011 in Akron, Ohio. As a result, I am sending this letter at your request. And to fulfill the agreement you made with Detectives Brown and Sink and inform you of the following. It is the intent of the Summit County Prosecutor's Office to pursue charges against you, which include aggravated murder for the death of Jacqueline Hilder between February 17th and 18th, 2011, in the city of Akron, Ohio, which is Summit County. Further, we will be pursuing a death specification, which will allow our office to seek a sentence of death. And that is your letter. I'm leaving it with you, yeah. off the deputy warden. So that's your letter to keep, and you can share it out with him there. We've reviewed our last interview with you, and we wanted to make sure that on your specifics, that's what you're wanting. And then again, if it is put in writing that this is a death penalty, 
I will answer all you have. And we have fulfilled this. You have not. How have we not fulfilled it? See your last sentence? Further, we will be pursuing a death specification which will allow office to seek. You guys remember what we talked about. So I don't want to be playing games with you guys. I'm guilty. I deserve whatever is coming my way. And I don't want us to seem like I'm mind gaming you guys or anything like that. But if you review your notes, my request was a, a guarantee. These people will be seeking a death penalty, which will still be refused. Some county is seeking the death penalty. It, you can't create a piece of paper that says, okay, you promised to kill me. It doesn't work that way in this country. It has to still go through processes. This is the first one, okay? They are seeking death, well, they are seeking a death specification. In the Ohio Revised Code, when you have aggravated murder, you have, you killed somebody, you committed this crime, and then you have more elements that it can elevate it to a death penalty case. They're telling you that they are considering those additional elements. To make it a death penalty case. To make case. it a death penalty case. So, I can't immediately condemn you you have to have a trial. That is the greatness of our justice system. But I, some county prosecutor has told you they are seeking the death penalty against you. So that's the best they can do, you see. That's it. Yeah. That's how it works. You still have to go to trial. So there is, okay, so there is no striking a deal with the DA, no try. Don't put the families through that. Hear me out. No try, don't put the families through that. I confess my guilt and I consent to death. Correct. I never heard of it. Ever. Now, as far as putting the family through the trial, they don't have to testify. If you're pleading guilty to the case, there's no testimony. And then they can then judge sentence and carry it out they want to need to have some kids. But they are now telling you, therefore, me they are seeking the death penalty, which is what you desired, as I recall from our last conversation. Yes, but I was a mess of God. Um, what you're asking, can I paraphrase? You're asking to say, I did these things. I want to be put to death. You sign it, they sign it, and then you're on death row. Yes. It does not, it, it can't, it does not work that way, okay? Why? Our justice system does not work that way. In other countries, maybe, but in our, you are afforded every single right possible. But and I don't want it, I want... I, am, I understand. I thought about it for nine years. DA sits there, I confess to my crimes, that's my deal. You promised to kill me. That's your deal. We sign a paper. I go on death row and wait for my death. It doesn't work that way. I'm telling you. It, I guarantee that they're seeking the death penalty. Yeah. Yeah, but seeking it, they may not get it. Here's, when it goes to, quote, the trial, they are going to put all the parts and pieces together for their case, for a death penalty case, okay? When you get a defense attorney, you can tell the defense attorney, I don't want to defend myself. That's your right to do that if you decide you want to do that. But we can't do it in New Mexico and then put you on the bus and take you back to uh, Akron and kill you. It doesn't work that way. You'll be transported, but you still have to go through a trial. You still have to go through the processes. I mean, it, you have to be afforded it's by virtue of our Constitution and all the land, we have to afford you those rights. We can't bypass those rights. And being that they are seeking the death penalty, they're going to go above and beyond those rights. And you, when you go to trial, you can tell your attorney that you want to waive all appeals and all that stuff, and they'll do what they'll follow your wishes because your attorney works for you. And you can expedite that process, but you still must be tried. There's no getting around that, sir. Then, uh, then, uh, I was, then, uh, 
You're going to stay. Are you wanting to stay here? No, but I don't want to go to Ohio and go through the same thing I've gone through here. Transport, transfers, counting, jail, all the, the, the moving around. Just, I'm guilty, death row, wait for death. Leave me in my cell for as long as it takes for my turn to die, and that's it. I'm telling you, it's never, ever, ever, ever going to work that way. It just won't. I'm just telling you, it won't. You have to be able to go in front of a judge, in front of a judge, which means you're transporting, and to plead guilty. And then that judge is going to say, well, you just got here. You need to talk to a defense attorney. You, they're going to give you chance after chance after chance to say, you know what, I want to live. Or, you know what, I want to defend myself. Those are the rights that are afforded in this country, and there's the system's not set to go around them. You cannot. As I told you last time, we would rather a guilty man go free than an innocent man go to jail. Here, here's, there's five facets to everything that we do, from stealing a candy bar at Walmart to murder, okay? It's the what, when, where, how, and why. We know what the what is. We know where the where is. We know when it happened. We know how it happened. I want to know why. And I think if part of what you're not wanting to do is to put the family through things, the why would be very beneficial for them because of the fact they don't know why their son's dead. Even if it's something they don't want to hear, I can't imagine the agonizing pain of my child, if it happened to my child, of not knowing why. And I know you've been sitting here for nine years. I was the first one on scene when, upon his death, I want to know why. I'm trying to understand. I'm still a cop. There's certain things that don't make sense. There's certain things in my heart that I'm like, okay, how, why, how, why'd you go here? How do all these different things happen? Um, this is it for us, okay? This, this is it for us. Akron, when they're done, you circle back down. You head south, just like you did that day. And then it, the whole thing starts over again, okay? What our goal is, I, I want you to listen to me, okay? Just hear me out. Our goal is to fill in all the blanks with what, when, where, how, and why. Get your confession so we can actually say, you know what? This is why this happened. Right, wrong, or different. This is why this happened. And then we hand it over to our prosecutor. They go ahead and put, they can't kill you twice. So if they're seeking the death penalty, our prosecutor, I don't know what they're gonna do, but we're gonna be able to look at them and say, here it is. Well, if you're tried and found guilty, or you confess, found guilty, whatever it is out there, I don't know if they'll bother with the trial we're at. Because once all said and done, we got the why answered. So, what I, you asked me, do you want to stay here? What are you saying about my extradition, extradition to Ohio? Is it dependent on something? No, no, no. We're not. For when they extradite you, they want as much done as possible prior to you being extradited. So that's why you got a letter here hand delivered to you. It says, okay, if that's what you want, then that's what we're going to go for. We've got the elements in the case to do it. So fine, here you go. So you ask me, do you want to stay here? What, 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 what does that question have to do with anything? I'm confused. No, but explain that to me. What does my speaking to you guys or not speaking to you has to do with my going to Ohio or staying here? You told me, told us, the last time we were here, 
And I'll give you the experts, excerpts of what we got. The crimes that you did here were a crime of opportunity. Then he told us that we can't prove that you pulled the trigger. Okay? It says, you said, I can fight you. I don't want to fight you. You prayed to God that he was ready to give, that you were ready to give your life. And we talked about, Ian and Brian talked about the different Bible knowledge that you can. So it's confusing to me that when you say you cannot prove that I pulled the trigger and then says, I don't want to fight you. And then we come here today and we've got a letter saying, okay, there you go. And I ask you, I'm, I'm confused. That's why I asked, are you wanting to stay here? Because you're not making sense on a couple different rounds here. So ask me the questions you are not clear on. What are you not clear on? Ask the questions. Okay. But, because I'm clear on my point. I don't want to go to Ohio and descend from Peter to Paul, moving up and down. You never know what's going on when you're going to try, you're going to see the story. I'm fed up with all this, the, your court system moving. I've been here nine years. You never settle down because you've got this court, you've got that court, you've seen this lawyer. When you're segregated here, you, you don't, you're by yourself, correct? I'm done with that. I just want to be left in a cell, wait for death, and that's it. I'm done with all the fighting. And that's not what you guys brought me. You are bringing me, you will seek death penalty, which means I still have to go through all the processes over there. Okay. This is the absolute life. best thing that can be done. Which is not what I asked for. We can't do I what we asked for. I understand you can't do what I asked for, but that's what I asked for. But it, so it's not what I asked for, though. Do you admit that? I understand. I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Okay. Do so you I want for us to go through our process, get this done, get your confession? Because if that's what you want to do, we're going to read you your rights and do all the parts and pieces that we're supposed to do. We do this because it's a constitutional right. We can't go around this <laughs> any way we want to look at it. We're talking to you prior to anything that we're talking about right now doesn't go into your prosecution because you haven't read your rights yet. So if you want to talk, answer questions, get this off your chest, give us the ability to actually go back to the family and say, this was why. We will read this to you and get this done. And if I don't, you leave. And then what happens after? I don't know. We're done. And we don't want to be done. I was there nine years ago. I want to know the why. You want to know the why. You went on the last time you talked to the family. Years. Years. Exactly my point. Because, uh, my family is in touch with their family. The family knows why, so. You are a stranger to me, I don't know you. I understand, but we're not trying to do, play games with you, try to do anything else, be mean to you. We're telling you exactly, this is all being recorded, this is all part of court. This is everything, okay? We're trying to do what we're supposed to do according to the Constitution and the laws afforded to you and try to write a letter that says, okay, fine, I'll admit to it, but you gotta kill me. It doesn't exist. It has to go through the process. And that's the thing I just... I understand. Okay. It doesn't mean I have to work with the process. I don't, I, I don't agree with that pro I understand the process. But it doesn't mean I have to consent to it. I would, uh, well, for the extradition? Yeah, you don't have to consent. That's why I was asking. Do you want to stay here? I don't, but I, I don't want to jump out of the pen into the fire in the center. I don't want to see here I'm in segregation. And I wouldn't either. Moving to Ohio, man, starting a new, that's why I just wanted a deal in place. Okay. Give us your confession. We will take you up here. That's what I told him last time. We'll pick you up here, take you straight to death penalty. No counties, no jails, no courts. We'll take you, we are moving from Ohio to death penalty and you wait your death. Good. I'm tired of the movement and the transportation. You told me last time that you had studied our laws in Ohio. 
you, you, you were quite confident in your knowledge of Ohio law. So based on your knowledge, you know, or should know, that I cannot just pick you up, stick you in death rows for them to stick the needle in your arm the next day. You know, or should know, that there has to be a trial. So I don't want to, I want to know the why as much as he did, but I don't appreciate being jerked around. I have given you a letter that Summit County is going to try to put you to death for, your, for the crime committed in Akron. That is the absolute best we can provide to you, which is not what I asked for. Okay. I know, so you, but you're asking, do you want the moon? We can't give you the moon either. We can't do what you're saying. Okay. Uh, All right. We could then. You are, I, that's it then. Because it's, I appreciate the letter, but you agree it's not what I asked for. I asked for a deal. Can we make a deal? Can a DA come? We make a deal. This boy confesses. I give all the details. Okay? We sign a deal to be ratified maybe before the judge. He consents to death. I understand you can't do it, but that's what I asked for. You can't do it then. There's nothing so, to do. Bottom line, you jerked us around for a year. I didn't. Yeah. You can ask if you can't do that. So, you have no desire to talk to us all today, is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing from you? I could ask, accuse you of checking me around for a year, you know. How? Because we were, I was clear to you the last time you were here. In fact, last time you wanted to talk to us, yes or no? I could accuse you of checking me around. I'm asking you a yes or no question. Because last time you were here, we discussed, we, I told you, I would like a deal in place so that I'll move here to And him. we told you we can't do that. Mm -hmm. but it's, it, I told you back then, yes. that doesn't exist. What you're asking for does not exist. So, this is the process of, to get you to death row, this is the process. This is the best that can be done. Yes. Because in this country, you have rights. You have, you have due process. You, you watch enough television to know that uh, many different prosecutors all over the nation tend to stay away from the death penalty because of the additional cost involved, not only the legal process, but all the other costs involved. So they have guaranteed you that they're going to go through those extra steps to get you what you want. I think we've done you a service, and as much as the law allows, we've given you what you asked for. You've admitted we could not give you exactly what you wanted because of our Constitution. We've given you, we've given you as much as we can within the confines of the law. I, yeah. I'd like to see some good faith on both parts here. But the, this is why I think we are missing the point. You guys have almost giving me the destination I asked for, but the reason I was choosing that destination is because I wanted to avoid the journey. I'm still getting the same journey. I still move to Ohio, to county, move from Icon to Dayton, transportation, population. The reason I was committed, I was consenting to death was it was going to save me from all this drama. I still get the drama. I still get the desired destination of death. This was a trade for me. I will take death to avoid all this drama of courts and trials and transportation and transfers. I'm fed up with all of that. I will trade that for death. I'm still getting the death, but now I'm getting it with all the drama I was trading in. I, am I making sense to something? You are making sense, but what you're asking for does not. Yes. You may need a trial. But yes. Your so okay. So what you're saying, I, I understand. I think I think I'm getting it. Okay. What you're saying is, the trade cannot be made. We are missing. We didn't get each other then. I was asking. I was trading all of the drama for the death. Mm -hmm. You guys are giving me the death that I asked for, but I still get the drama I was trying to avoid. Do you get me? I was willing to take the death if it saves me from the drama. Okay. I'm still getting the death, but with the drama I was trying to avoid. 
So, it, and I told you this, if you check your notes, last time I said, if I'm going to go through the drama, then I might as well fight it. Because the reason I'm giving up the fight is so that I die. The reason I'm dying is so that I, I don't fight it. It's not that I just surrender. I give up that right. But if I still have to go through all the hooks, why give up my right to live then? I was giving up the right to live to avoid the drama, the spectacle. I understand. If I still have to go through transport, move to this county, you go into this court. That's why I chose death to avoid that. I understand. Is there no system where I can avoid that? No. Then why die if I'm still going to go through all this drama? Why then give up my life? That's why I said to you guys, I will talk to you if it guarantees me death and saves me this drama here. But if it still comes with this drama, then I am talking to you. Then okay. if, the, if the drama cannot be avoided, then I must go fighting. I said that last time. Okay. I don't think I've checked you guys about. You have judges. Right? No, I told you that last time. That's fine. You have every... You if have... the drama can be avoided, I will avoid it. Kill me. But if you can't avoid the drama, then why am I dying for? Do you want to talk to us or not? I will if you don't avoid me the trouble. We can't, it's the, the, the mechanism's not in place. Then why, then why die for that? I don't know. Last time you told me that God told you to do that. <laughs> they told me what? He told me that you prayed. Yes. And that God said you need to give up your life because of the life you took. Or why lives you took. Yes, and I'm willing to do that. But you're telling me, you're telling me that God said, well, you can do this if you don't have to go to the drum. Come on, man. That's the problem. That's the prospect problem. That's fine. You want to talk to us? Come on. Not if I'm going to go through the same time in Ohio. Bye-bye. I told you guys to Ohio. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay. You're not going to see me again. Do you want to confess to what you did? And do you want to confess to what you did? Do you want to go through the death going that they want to see? And do you want to put rest of this and do the right thing? Your call, man. Do you want to do this? I told you last time, I'm telling you the same thing, but I'll check my strategy. You know we can't do what you're asking. You know we can't. Then I can't do anything else about it then. If you guys, if I, my talk, I told you the same thing. My talking to you guys avoids the trauma okay. and takes me straight to that. Get him out of here.